Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, um, verses 8, 10, and 11, 8, 10, and 11. This is where we're getting, verse 8 is where we're getting the title of our series. He says, prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe because we're descendants of Abraham. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. And that's just like any of us. We're not, we aren't born into the kingdom of God because of, by birthright, because of the fact that our parents were Christians. I don't become a Christian. I don't go to heaven just because I got good parents or I do good things. I actually have to repent and turn to the Lord. And so he says, listen, you've got to do something. So skipping down to verse 10, the crowds asked, what should we do? And John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. So John said, the proof that you have repented is generosity. Number one is generosity. And so you think about what has generosity got to do with repentance? Why does it show, why does it show that you have repented if you're generous? Well, it proves that we have, our motives have been changed and our selfishness has been killed. Now remember, in this portion of the scripture, when John, when the crowd says, what should we do? Remember, this is fellow Jews and uh, Gentiles, but fellow Jews mostly that are asking John, what should we do? And he knows that they are, they are oppressed. And we talked about that last week. They are an oppressed people and they are extorted they have the Roman government is oppressing them and they can any a Roman soldier could come up at any time and say, hey, I want I like that shirt. Give me that shirt and take your shirt. And if they want food, whatever they want, they can take from them. And so they have adopted what I what we call a poverty mindset. So a poverty mindset says, listen, I got to hold on to everything I have because I won't get any more. I might not get any more. I've got to hold on to everything because I might not get any more. That's a poverty mindset. Now, there are people that have a lot of money that have a poverty mindset that keep saying, I've got to hold on to because we might not get any more. And we could, we could become that way at the church here because we've got us a, a nice little money market account, I mean, relatively, but we could say, well, we've got to hold on to that. We've got to hold on to it because, you know, we might not get any more. Well, I want to ask you, what is Jesus going to say when you get to heaven and you say, hey, we kept our money market good. We kept our account good. Instead of saying we used it to, to reach the loss for the kingdom. So we've got a poverty, they've got a poverty mindset. So John was addressing something that was really at the root of what they were thinking about, their poverty mindset. So this word generosity, in the King James Version, they use the word liberality. The word liberality, and in the Greek, it is haplotes, H-A-P-L-O-T-E-S, haplotes. Liberality means haplotes, and it's a singleness. Uh, when it's subjectively used, it means sincerity or without dissimulation or self-seeking. But when it's used objectively, it means generosity or copious bestowal or bountifulness or liberality. I like that copious bestowal. Haplotus is actually a, a combination of two different words. So it is one word that has the ah. So it, you look at it and you see the H in front of it, but act like that H is not even there. So you have the ah, the A, which is a neg negation. So anytime in the Greek that you have the, the letter A start a word, a Greek word, that means it's negating what's fixing to come. It's what's happening. No, it's, it's like the word but. It's, this is so-and-so, but, so it's, it's negating what's fixing to happen. But it comes from, then the word pleco, is P-L-E-K-O, means to twine, braid, weave, or knit. So it negates the twine, so it untwines, unbraids, unweaves, and unknits. So it means singleness, simplicity, uprightness, mental honesty. The virtue of one who is free from pretense and dissimulation. Haplotis pertains to being motivated by singleness of purpose. Think about this. Singleness of purpose so as to be open and above board without guile, 
and without a hidden agenda. J. Vernon McGee says, Haplotus means there should not be any taint of duplicity. There should be no two-facedness. There should not be the licking of the boots of the employer when he is around and then stabbing him in the back when he's away. Such actions should never be in the life of a Christian. So haplotes, liberality, means that you don't have a hidden agenda. It means that you, you, don't, you don't have a, a hidden purpose. There's nothing, there's, you know, a lot of times, remember, I'm filtering when I get quiet. So a lot of times, my wife will think, okay, what did they mean by that? So she'll ask me, what do you mean by that? And she's, she's got to understand men just say what they think. They're, they don't really have hidden... A lot of times women will have subtle things behind what they're saying. They're trying to be, you know, say a little something without saying it, passive-aggressive, that sort of thing. So there's a little agenda, there's a little something like that. But typically, as a rule, men are just, they're open books. They just say what they, whatever's in their mind. So it's like you don't have a hidden agenda, and so, gen generosity should be practiced no matter your financial situation. No matter what state your finances are in. Because it's not just money, but we're basically ad addressing money. But it doesn't matter what your financial situation is. Even if it doesn't appear that you have enough. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. New Living Tr Translation. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what, kind, what, what, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. So he's talking about what somebody else has done. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves. Part of their generosity was they gave themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to do. So he's telling the Corinthians, they say, Hey, the churches in Macedonia, they don't have anything. But they begged us to give to the, to the believers in Jerusalem. So now the, the churches in Macedonia, what he's talking about, the northern part of Greece was what's called Macedonia. The southern part, well, now, we, it was called, well, see, we've, I've pronounced this Achaia. And I listened this morning. I went to my little app and found out actually how to pronounce Achaia. And it's Achaia. Achaia. It's not Achaia, it's Achaia. Okay, so, but that was the, uh, the city of, and Corinth was in Achaia. And Paul writes about the examples of the churches of Macedonia. So the Macedonia is the northern part of Greece, and Achaia is the southern part. So Colossians, uh, Corinthians is in, Corinth is in the southern part, and uh, Macedonian churches are churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Thessalonica and Berea. So he talked about their great trial of affliction. See, Paul reports to the Corinthian Christians the example of the Macedonian Christians. The Macedonians, though, they were, the King James says, a great trial of affliction. And though they were in deep poverty, they still gave generously. Paul was raising money to help the Christians in Jerusalem who were very poor. See, he talked about this to the Corinthians in, chap in, in 1 Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians. He told them about him raising money for the believers in Jerusalem. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, he says, Now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should put aside a portion of the money that you've earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me to go along, they can travel with me. So, see, the poverty of the Macedonians was confirmed in secular history. The Romans took most of the Macedonians' wealth when they conquered the former homeland of Alexander the Great. 
they just pretty much pillaged everything. When they conquered that, that's where Alexander the Great was from. So Paul didn't have to beg the Macedonians to give. They begged Paul to give, even though they didn't have anything. They were generous. They were imploring us in King James. It says imploring us to see if they could... It means that the Macedonians begged Paul for the privilege of giving. Now, Paul didn't beg them for the money. He wouldn't have done that. So, though the Macedonian Christians didn't have much to give, give they really wanted to give. They saw it as a privilege to give. True Christian generosity can't be measured by how much one has to give. Often, those who have left are more generous than what, than what they have. Uh, the writer Hughes says the example of the Macedonians is practical truth, proof that true generosity is not just the prerogative of those who have plenty. The most genuine generosity is frequently displayed by those who have the least to give. Christian giving is estimated in terms not of quantity, but of sacrifice. Remember, Jesus was standing with his disciples watching the offering at the temple. And the widow gave her two mites. In other words, gave two pennies. And he said, listen, she gave more than anybody else because she gave all that she had. Everybody else has been given out of their abundance and she gave all that she had. Sacrificial giving is, is, generosity, is generosity. So see, remember the Philippian church. So this occurred to me. The Philippian church was in Macedonia. And they are part of the ones that gave this money. So interestingly enough, and you'll recognize the scripture, and I'm going to read, I'm reading a lot of scripture here, but in Philippians chapter 4, starting verse 10, Paul says, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. He's writing to the Philippians. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever I have, with whatever I have. I now, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. Who gives, sorry, I quoted King James while I was reading the International Version. Just. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. Remember, these are, this Philippian church is in Macedonia that they're, all their money had been taken. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And I'm going to read verse 19 now of the King James. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. See, we quote that scripture, and we don't understand. He is telling them because they were sacrificed, they gave to him sacrificially. He said, my God shall supply all your need because you gave sacrificially. So we are to give no matter what our financial circumstance if we have nothing and we are also to give if we are blessed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, Now he who supplied seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. That this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have provided yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience. In other words, other people are going to be rejoicing and thanking God because of your giving. That accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. 
And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. God will supply seed to the sower and bread for food. He will also increase your sowing. He will also increase your bread. He will provide seed to the sower. In other words, if you are a giver, if you're generous, God is going to provide something for you to be generous with. That's what he's saying here. Now remember, he's not just saying seed to sow. He's saying bread for you to eat. I thought find that interesting. We always talk about sowing and reaping, but he also said he'll provide bread for your food. So he'll provide something for you to be generous with and something for you to have. So we are to be generous no matter what state we are. But also generosity has personal benefits. Generosity is personally beneficial. But it has physical and emotional health benefits. So there is a... Emily Vega had a, a blog. She's a, a Christian woman that writes, Christian lady that has a blog. And she wrote, 10 awesome benefits to being generous. And I just put the 10, list of 10. She's got a whole blog. And <coughs> Number one, generosity promotes physical health. Number two, being generous reduces stress. How many can use that? It encourages personal health. Generosity gives you a longer life. Number five, it strengthens your marriage. I thought about that and I thought, you know, how many women love to see the, their husband be generous? Because you know they've got a kind heart. I don't know if it's kind of, it's, it's, I guess it's the same husbands to wives, but when a wife sees a husband being generous, you know they've got a kind heart, so it strengthens your marriage. It builds deeper friendships. Generosity leads to success. Let me stop for a minute. We were talking with the missionaries, I was talking with the missionaries from the Ivory Coast when I picked them up last, uh, last Tuesday. I picked them up from the airport in Houston Tuesday night and we're driving back with them. And they were talking about how they can't get it through the minds of the, the Africans there, the people from the Ivory Coast, how to, about giving. Because in their mindset, they've got that poverty mindset. They hold on to everything they can get. And they, they connive to get. They, they, they do everything they can to get. And they don't, they, they, whatever they can. And it's just to get by today. They're, all they're thinking about is just today. I've got to get by today. I've got to get, just get through today. They're not thinking about the future. And so generosity, they, they said, we cannot get through to them. I said, but I said, the thing is, is that they've got to understand it's also a, a business principle. You know, in business, a lot of times, like, you go to the mall, and you walk through the food court, and they're giving out samples. What are they doing? They're trying to, they're giving you something free to create a desire for you to go buy some. So a lot of times, a lot of strategies, you give you give a free thing away for people and then they'll come and buy something because people love to do business with people they like. So it will lead to success. Number eight, it allows you to experience God. Number nine, it changes someone's world. And number 10, generosity is contagious. Now, uh, I've got a little video I want you to look at about the actual health, why the health benefits of generosity there's nothing else that we do they couldn't find any other thing we do that we say i will i intend to do this that causes a neurological or neurobiological biological reaction in your happiness center except for our commitment to be generous i mean that's huge right there you're wired city wigglesworth who's a neurobiologist was talking about when we have this place of generosity developed it actually should be called our true north or staying in our lane empathy honor inspiration and servanthood these these four areas when they're done out of generosity that we live the most out of our true north than if any other measure measurable thing that we can do now as a kingdom person we know that all generosity comes from compassion empathy or passion for people now the neurobiological community is using those three exact same things that people like you know, back in the day, back in 1906, 1907, Barna, or not Barna, uh, Biola College, they put out a message on what motivates generosity back then, or 1918, I think was the first time I saw it. I didn't see it, I saw them, 1918. And they said, compassion, passion, and empathy 
are the motivators of generosity. Now the neurobiological community are saying the exact same thing. Science and the Bible intersects, it's great. Now biologically, did you know that generosity releases oxytocin? It's one of the only things we do outside of direct relational connection that produces oxytocin on this level. As a matter of fact, these tests are marvelous. If you heard my message about a month and a week ago, here I talk about what oxytocin is, it's the cuddle hormone. It's the hormone that keeps us connected in relationship, unlike dopamine, which is immediate gratification. Oxytocin is the bonding hormone. It keeps you in monogamous relationship. It keeps you loyal to your best friends. It keeps you in connection to relationship with God. Oxytocin is released in places of worship they found now. Uh, they've, they've measured oxytocin release during worship times and devotion to God. It's, it's freaking out the scientific community because you're like, oh my gosh, God is so real to them that they're having the same bonding hormone release as they would to a monogamous relationship. It's scary to the biological community. But gratitude is one of the only practice things that we do outside of falling in love or outside of romance or outside of like a good buddy-buddy connect time. Gra or not gratitude. Generosity is one of the only things that we do that actually releases oxytocin which is beyond dopamine. Dopamine is like a quick hormone, quick fix thing. Oxytocin makes you, your sense of well-being higher. Your everyday sense of well-being. And so being generous releases more oxytocin than any other uh, behavior that we can find outside of direct relationship. Oxytocin connects us to others and the social connections are, are uh, so powerful that they increase one's happiness. If you want to connect to others, being generous is the greatest start. So it has health benefits. So what is generosity? What is biblical generosity? I'm fixing to blow your mind. So I came across a journal note, because I, I, I journal periodically, kind of sporadically, from September the 15th, 2018. And I had watched, I don't know if it's this video, this is Sean Bowles. I, I don't know if it's this video or another one on generosity. The night before, I'd watched a video on generosity. That next morning, on September the 15th, my scripture reading had Proverbs 22, 9. It says, blessed are the, those who are generous because they feed the poor. So I said, God, you're trying to talk to me or something? So being generous is feeding the poor, is giving to those that are are less fortunate is and not only just money but giving uh, food giving clothes giving uh, whatever they need whatever someone is in need there it's also it's giving uh, to the poor generosity is not just um, uh, hold on so generosity is not just giving money away but if there are uh, Deuteronomy 15 now, Deuteronomy, remember, this is in the, the Torah, in the five books of Moses. God uses this to create all the laws. And in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God's giving Moses all the instructions that, the, that they are to live by. These are the things they are to live by. And so he says, but if there are any poor Israelites in your towns, when you arrive in the land, the Lord your God has given you. So if there are any poor Israelites in those towns, when you get there, don't be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Instead, be generous and lend them whatever they need. So we know generosity is giving stuff away. But he said, be generous and lend them whatever they need. Don't be mean-spirited and refuse someone alone because the year for canceling debts is close at hand. He's talking about the year of Jubilee. Remember, every 50 years... On the 50th year, that's the year of Jubilee. So if someone had to, to sell a piece of property because they, couldn't because they were in debt, they got that property back. If they had a loan, that loan was forgiven. Everything was forgiven. All debts canceled. If they had gone into slavery, you know, they had debt prisons then. They had uh, people gone, went, became slaves because they were indebted to somebody and they worked it off. If, they were, if you were a slave and you hadn't worked off your debt when the year of Jubilee came, you were freed. So he says, don't, don't, be, uh, don't hold back. Don't refuse someone alone because the year of canceling debt. In other words, when it's in this year, it's June or July on the 49th year, and it's going to take two years to pay back a loan, don't say, well, I ain't going to give it to you until 51, till, the year, till we start over again. 
because then you can't pay. Because the thing is, is they start, they take out the loan, and it's going to take two years. Then it comes the year, the fiftieth year. Then they got to forgive that debt. What the prop, the thing is, is he's trying to teach them. Listen, I am your supplier. You don't look to somebody repaying a debt to be your source. I am your source. I will bless you when you are generous and you lend to someone knowing that their debt is going to be forgiven. So he says, don't refuse them. If you refuse to make the loan and the needy person cries out to the Lord, you will be considered guilty of sin. Wow. Give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. There will always be some in the land who are poor. Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always. There's always going to be, that's why we, we will never eradicate p poverty. Because of the fact that we have poverty mindsets. Because people, people will keep themselves in poverty because of this mindset that they have that they can't get out of it. Some people are so, we talked about some people that they, they get into the welfare system and they can't get out because that is their identity. That's who they are. And if they, if they ever got out of that, they wouldn't know who they are. They wouldn't have any, any identity. They couldn't, you know, so this is who we are. We're poor people. And church people have taken pride in not having money. In other words, it's, an, it's another form of pride. And they look to the rich people and say, all oh, them rich people, all oh, them rich people, and, and turn their nose up to rich people. And you're the same way. So, oh, we're just poor. Look at us. We're just poor. And, and we're, we, we love God. And, we're, you know, God loves the poor people and stuff like that. And it's like, but God loves rich people too. Look at Abraham. He made Abraham rich and wealthy. I mean, the scripture I'm reading right now in my, in my scripture reading, I'm reading in Genesis where he's talking about, and, and when the servant went to go find a, a, a bride for, for Isaac, he, he went to them, he said, God has made my master rich in cattle and sheep and gold and silver, make him exceedingly wealthy, it says in the scripture. God made him wealthy. So, see, the church people have said, no, see, God wants to keep us poor so we can stay humble. You can be humble and wealthy. It's just, you know, it's just a whole mindset. So he says, listen, I will bless you. There will always be somebody in the land who's poor. That's why I'm commanding you to share freely with the poor and with other Israelites in need. Psalm 37, 26 says, the godly always give generous loans to others and their children are a blessing. So loaning Money is being generous. Remember that poverty mindset? Even if you're loaning money, you say, I, I can't let go of it because they might not pay me back, and then I won't have any. They'll have it, and I won't. See, that being generous is sometimes loaning something. And when you're talking about a brother, in other words, in the Scripture, and also in Leviticus, he talks in Leviticus or Deuteronomy, I can't remember which one, he's saying, uh, don't, don't take somebody's coat for surety for a loan. In other words, don't, you want collateral? If it's a brother or a sister, don't take collateral for the loan. Just loan it to them. Now, if it's somebody outside, if it's some, a foreigner or something like that, then you can take collateral. But don't take collateral. from. So God is saying, you got to trust me. Trust me with what I do. Now, so we understand what generosity is, but see, generosity should also be a planned activity in our life. It should be something that we're planning. Remember Robert Morris, the video series that we did, he talked about stewardship, that giving, you should plan to give. You plan your tithe, you plan any offerings you're going to give. If you plan it, then you're going to give. And so in Psalm chapter, in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 8, but generous people plan to do what is generous. And they stand firm in their generosity. In other words, you, can, you plan to give, but then things get a little tight. And you say, well, you know, we want to give that. We kind of plan to do that, but it's kind of tight now, so we better not do that. No, God says if you stand firm in your generosity, you'll be blessed. So you plan to give, and you give it. So it also should be a lifestyle. Generosity should be a lifestyle. Psalm 112, 4 says, Light shines in the darkness for the godly. They are generous, compassion, compassionate, and righteous. Proverbs 11:25 The generous will prosper those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed so he calls generosity refreshing somebody how many knows if you don't have money and somebody 
gives you money, you feel better about yourself now. You've got some money. You can do some stuff. If, somebody, if you don't have, if you don't, I'm, I remember when we were younger, uh, one time we were, uh, I think we were living, I forget, I think we were living in Garland or something like that, and, and we had gotten to the place where we didn't have anything. We had, we had some oatmeal or some malt, I don't know, oatmeal, malt milk, or something like that, but we didn't have any butter or sugar or milk or nothing to put in it. And so we were struggling. And then that very day, my grandmother comes to the house with several bags that, because my grandmother is the one that if she goes to the store, if something's on sale, I'm not just going to buy two of them. I'm going to buy a case of it. So my grandmother would buy a case. In fact, when she passed, when she moved into the retirement home, they, had, they were finding food everywhere because she would buy cases of food when it was on sale. And so she brought us food and stocked our pantry with food. And nobody had to tell her. She, we didn't tell anybody, but we, we lived high on the hog. We felt good. We were refreshed because we had food then. Because we just had to eat our, our oatmeal plain that morning. And then she brought that without, without and my grandmother wasn't even serving the Lord then. There were so many times my grandmother was used of the Lord and she wasn't even a believer. And we didn't tell her our situation. But she would do that. She would do that. In fact, when my dad got ready to start his church in Garland, there was a, a house that they wanted to have church in. So she went to the bank and borrowed $75 to pay the rent. The first month's rent. She had to borrow $75 from the bank back in 69 to, to start the church. So she did that. She believed that my dad could do anything. So anyway, you refresh them. First uh, Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy says, Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. It should be a lifestyle, always ready to share with others. So generosity is personally beneficial. It helps it has health benefits. It helps us psychologically. It helps in so many ways. But generosity, we are to be generous no matter our financial position, when it looks like we don't have anything or when we are blessed. And generosity proves that our motives have been changed, that we, our motives have been changed. It proves that our selfishness has been killed and then that we have repented and turned to the Lord. Generosity proves. So the proof of the pudding is in the generosity. When we are generous, it proves that we have turned our heart to the Lord because we have cold, selfish hearts before we turn to the Lord. And he says, look, I'm going to take that, that heart of stone and I'll replace it with a heart of flesh. He said, I'm going to put compassion back into your heart. I'm going to put grace back into your heart. I'm going to put generosity back into your heart. You're going to start thinking of others instead of just yourself. He said, listen, I'm going to do that for you. But we have to, it proves. That's why he said it is proof of our generosity. Generosity is proof that we have repented. And so as, as we go here, we got to understand that proof is in the pudding. That generosity is proof that we have turned to the Lord. Amen. Amen. 